self-care and self-love is your birthright, no matter if you have money or not. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to The Lavender Lifestyle. It's your host, Eileen. Today, we have a very inspiring episode on connecting with ourselves, connecting with nature, and recognizing how accessible spirituality truly is. Everything around you can be a tool for deepening your relationship with yourself and healing. So our guest today is Juliet Diaz. Juliet Diaz is a bruja, seer, and spiritual activist. She's an indigenous Taino Cubana from a long line of healers and brujas. She believes magic lives within us all. She feels passionate about inspiring others to step into their truth, wake to their remembrance, and liberate themselves from the oppressor within. Juliet is a multiple bestseller author. Her works include witchery, plant witchery, the altar within, and decks. So in this episode, we talk about Juliet's indigenous perspective on spirituality and nature, what self-love and self-care really is, and even got into her death experience, what she saw and experienced when she had a heart attack and died for about three minutes, and how that experience transformed everything for her. This is one that you really don't want to miss. So here's Juliet Diaz. Hello, Juliet. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. I'm so excited to talk to you today. I am even more excited to speak to you today. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah, I was like, I wanted to say speak, but I changed it to talk and it sounded like stuck. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you seem like you have such a fascinating lineage and history. So I want you to start with that, like your story. Tell us about your lineage first. Yeah, sure. So my family is indigenous to Cuba. So we're a mixture of indigenous Taino and African descent. And I'm actually first generation um, in this country. So as you can imagine, you know, my life growing up has been very chaotic and very hard. Um, and it's where my origin story of being connected to my spirit and the earth and the plants and everything that's spiritual, because it's what got me through a lot of the hardships in my life. I see. And were these things that were openly shared in your family growing up, like your parents kind of taught you everything you know? Well, the thing is, I didn't know that our lifestyle was different until I was about five or six when I started, you know, when we started school. And I started to notice that, you know, things that I would talk about or I would see how the other children were kind of con not connecting to the earth, not connecting to the plants not really connecting to spirit because I'm a seer. I also see um, spirits and auras. So I learned really quickly that we were different, that we weren't normal. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, so for me, it was a lifestyle. And yes, our family is very in tune. And this is something that is spoken about a lot. But again, because I am first generation and my parents are immigrants, they didn't really have a lot of time to sit with me and to explain to me um, you know, the beauty of the practices in my family, because they were always in survival mode. So that is also why, you know, today I am, I am an activist, I am a spiritual activist. Um, and I speak a lot about, you know, having compassion about your family and your parents, especially if they're immigrants, especially if they're new to a new land. And, you know, they were always trying to survive and didn't have that time to connect with you. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, no, I just learned from watching my mother. So it's interesting that you talk about the experience of being like a first gen American and how your parents, like you had to heal from certain things. Cause like considering that they were spiritual people, it's interesting that, you know, these sort of things still happen, even if you're spiritual and in tune. Yes. And right? that's a really big message that I have for my community. I just wrote a book that just came out recently. I didn't just write it. It just came out recently. Um, the altar within and it, that's what it tackles. It tackles the spiritual and wellness um, communities and industries where, you know, they paint this picture that in order for you to be spiritual, in order for you to spiritually grow, in order for you to be divine or in a state of manifesting, you have to have positive vibes only, um, good vibes only, right? And they leave out pretty much every single person who has gone through hardships and who's struggling in life, who don't have the resources 
And it's not true. That doesn't make them any less spiritual. It doesn't let, make them any less connected to the earth or to the divine selves. So I really feel yeah. passionately about spreading that message that no matter what you're going through in your life, you are worthy and you are a sacred being. Yeah, I love that. And it, it kind of changes the notion that when you're spiritual, you are like perfect and nothing can touch you. It's it's really not like that. We're still human at the end of the day. And the challenge helps you like in your journey, right? Become more connected. And it's even if you are more spiritual and connected, doesn't, yeah, it, it, there's no end. There's no perfection. There isn't. There isn't an, a hierarchy. There isn't chosen ones. We all yeah. have sacredness and power and magic within us, every single one of us. And perfection is dehumanizing, right? Mm. It's this, this place where, you know, you're forcing people to become a character at this point because they're ignoring their true emotions. And these emotions are really important in your spiritual growth. So when people tell you, you know, ignore these negative low frequency energies and emotions, what you're doing is you're missing the opportunity to allow these emotions to guide you to where you need healing within yourself. And that is where the spiritual growth starts to happen when you address those emotions. Yeah. Um, let's, I I do want to get to like each of your books, but before we get to that, I do want to hear more about your perspective of like, like mainstream, how mainstream sees spirituality and witchery and magic, right? Cause you, you have books talking about these concepts. So explain from your perspective, what these things mean to you. For me, it's since I came out with my first book with witchery and then plant witchery and the altar within every work that I do and the message that I spread is I knew since I was very young, um, because of the hardships that I was going through, because of the family I come from, and I'm very connected to my ancestors um, and of course my tribe, we believe that everyone is sacred, everyone is spiritual. And then you have new age spirituality or even in the witchcraft community where a lot of people have this hierarchy system when someone's better than you and Mm -hmm. someone has more experience than you. So they're better than you or they're gifted and you're not, you know, there's a whole bunch of BS, a, a whole bunch of misunderstanding and misinformation that doesn't allow a certain individual who is curious about tapping into the divine self and their magic to move forward with it because they don't feel like they belong. They don't feel like they're good Mm -hmm. enough or worthy. They don't even know where to Mm -hmm. start. So the, like what is the myth, like the biggest myths or things that you want to bust, like from all these like new age thoughts and beliefs, self care, self love is a a luxury. Mm. It's a myth and it's not real. Mm Self-care and self-love is your birthright, no matter if you Um, have money or not. Self-care, self-love doesn't look like only going to the spa, paying for expensive memberships that helps you with your spirituality, um, going on these beautiful vacations. Those things are all nice. Don't get me wrong. We all do want that. But you're leaving out a ton of people who are not able to access that, who are not able to live in that way. You're also leaving out people who don't have the same belief systems that you, right? Not every person believes in the same thing. So if we're going to define spirituality into a box and where this box doesn't include the majority of the people, the suffering, I really do believe that spirituality also includes the suffering. If it yeah. didn't, then we're contradicting ourselves that we are all one. Mm-hmm. There's no way that that is a truth because you're leaving out a majority of people. Right. So what do you want to tell our audience about what spirituality is supposed to be, you know, for for everyone? Spirituality should be the solve of your life. It should be something that supports you mentally, spiritually, and physically. It could be anything at all, anything that for you makes you happy for you brings you joy that you are con- that brings you connection to your ancestors that brings you connection to the earth that brings you connection to your creativity and that does not look like everybody else we have this thing that we do as humans um, where we compare ourselves to each other especially on social media right we all want to look and be like certain people that you aspire or you're inspired by But the truth is you become more powerful in your unique self and in doing practice in the way that supports you and the way that you connect to it. Before we go on, let's take a break to hear about today's sponsor, Ephemeris. 
you likely know that I love astrology. It's a powerful tool that can help guide your journey to self-discovery. There's so much you can learn just by studying your birth chart. For example, I have three planets in Libra in my fifth house, so I know that creativity and balance is really important for my soul. Ephemeris is creating astrological talismans, basically a highly customizable piece of jewelry based on your birth chart. To create your own, you'll need your date, time, and location of birth. It's okay if you don't know your birth time, you can still create a version of your chart. As you enter your info, the birth chart will update so you'll be able to see how your talisman will actually look. You can choose from silver, gold, or rose gold. Each unique piece is handmade in the US and it also comes with three in-depth reports on your birth chart. My report was 82 pages long so there's definitely a lot of good info to explore about yourself. Right now, Ephemeris is offering 15% off for our listeners with an offer code TLL at checkout. That's www.ephemeris.co and offer code TLL at checkout to unlock 15% off your talisman today. Right. I love that. There's no like ideal thing that you're supposed to do for self-love, self-care. To be honest, it's it's the beauty industry. It's all these wellness industries. They're, they're just trying to make money off of you. So it doesn't have to look like what it looks like on Instagram or YouTube or anywhere. It, yeah, it's I, up I, to you speak, to create that. Yes. I speak very loud about it in the ultimate yeah, Within. Um, I, I speak that. very loud about um, we have to dismantle and banish the oppressor within us. And the oppressor within us is you know, happen through colonization and colonization happened to all of us, whether you believe it or not, not just to my indigenous um, family and ancestors, but to every single one of us, because colonization is taking your birthrights, taking your belief systems, taking um, your truth and diluting it and turning it into something like an industry now where wellness Mm -hmm. and self-care and spirituality and witchcraft, it's all turned into an industry where yeah. you have to have these tools, you have to have these crystals, you have to have these candles, right? I and, know. and people think buying more of that will make them more spiritual. Well, right. it's not and true. Truth, it's not true. In truth, they are tools that will mm-hmm. help amplify, but they're not going to work if you're not connected to yourself and if you haven't built a true relationship with yourself. So the healing part of the journey as a human and the healing comes, not that it's not that you're supposed to heal at when you come into this world, but because of the way the world is, we've suffered so many traumas. We suffered so many identity um, confusions because we take on what everyone else tells us. If your mom told you, for instance, when you were young, you know, you're, you don't clean good enough or you're not, you know, you're not fast enough or you're not pretty enough or whoever said anything negative to you, you start to take on these um, subconscious identities and titles onto yourself. And then you start to create this character where you start to believe these things. So the healing journey is to really strip yourself from those things that make you feel like you aren't whole. Those things that really don't speak truth to who you are. It's a reparenting. It's a relearning and a rebirth of your true self. In that space, when you start to connect to your true self, That is where the magic happens because from that space, your intentions are actually real intentions. They're not intentions that are coming from this person that you created or went along with and have this false notion of an intention that they probably want to create in their life. I hope that makes sense. (laughs) Yeah, no, no, it does make sense because sometimes what people want is not what they actually want. It's what like everyone else has told them to want. And so it's, it's like making sure you're asking the real you and get connecting to the, the inner true you. I wanted to ask you, how do you know, or I guess, how do you connect and know that this is the real you? Yeah. So that is where the work comes in. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is definitely where the work comes in. The only thing that I can say is don't be scared of this kind of work, like inner child work, shadow work, all that should come after you start creating a relationship against with yourself. So I always suggest, like I suggest in a book, work on self-patience, work on self-trust, Work on setting boundaries and self-boundaries. Work on identifying where these negative voices are coming from and find the root cause of them. 
So what you do is I, my favorite thing to do is make a list of things that, you know, tell you that you're unworthy, that you're not good enough, write them all down and then try to remember, meditate on it if you have to and see where originally that came from. Where was it said to you? What experience caused that? And then sit with that experience or that rooted cause and ask yourself, is this true? Is this really true? And you're going to find that a lot of the things that you say to yourself or the voices in your head tell you are not true about you because there is no way that your divine self would suggest that you aren't good enough to Mm. go for your dreams, to manifest what you want, to live a divine life. So it's really important to build a great and trustworthy, strong foundation of a relationship with yourself. Yeah, totally agree. I love that. I love the way you speak with that conviction too. It just shows that you've done so much work in your own journey. I feel it. (laughs) Yeah, I I definitely feel it. Um, So take us through the journey of your books because I want to hear about each of them. They're each very interesting. So let's start with like your first hit, which was Witchery, right? So what is that book about? What was your, like the main message that you wanted to share with that book? When I think about witchery, it's I, it just it came out in 2019. I swear, I feel like it was 10 years ago. <laughs> it was so pre-pandemic, much. another world. Yeah, yeah it's pre-pandemic. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so to me, it um, was a whole different person writing that, but it's very interesting how the message in the book still um, is within me, but amplified at this point. I'm more confident with the message now. When I was writing that book, um, we had the publisher reach out to me and say, because I had a really nice big community around um, spiritual and witchcraft. And I wrote the book and I said to myself, they want me to write a book about witchcraft, right? Because I'm a bruja. And Mm -hmm. I came back to them and I told them, the only way I will write a book for you is if you allow me to be myself and speak truth as to how my indigenous culture and how I see um, witchcraft and spirituality and how I believe magic is here. I don't want to write another witchcraft book that's been out there already. I don't want to repeat the same information. And I really don't want to write about black hats and, you know, pointy hats. (laughs) Because that's, Mm -hmm. you know, at that point, I remember in that year, that's what everybody was fascinated about. I see. In that book, I speak about, and I speak to the readers and I tell the readers that in witchcraft or any practice, spiritual practice, it doesn't matter what belief you're in. It is important that it comes from you, from your truth, for you to create a practice that speaks to you and supports you, that you don't have to follow a certain way, certain rules. You don't have to follow a certain path, but if you do mold it so that it supports you and feels right to you, For instance, Mm -hmm. I also talk about cultural appropriation, right? And the reason, and I talk about it in that book and speaking on it to me, it comes from the idea or from the perspective that if you don't practice something that's connected truly to your ancestors or to your land or to who you are, you're not going to amplify your magic as at its limitless potential, right? And unlimited potential. I said limitless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) So. For me, it's be who you are, your authentic self. You have a unique blueprint in your own journey. It's not like everybody else's. So create a life, create a practice that speaks to who you are and to what brings you joy. And those things are going to amplify your your happiness and it's going to amplify your magic and your manifesting power. I love that. And just a quick little rewind, because I'm sure some people, when they hear the word witchery or witchcraft, they they probably have a different notion than what you're talking about. So can you just, you know, for those people who don't really understand what it is, quickly ex- explain what you mean when you say witchcraft, what is it? And then how is it different when you say indigenous with witchcraft, right? Compared yeah, to what so we know. <laughs> Sure. So for me, I'm indigenous. So I have um, indigenous culture and practices where we have different belief systems. We believe in different gods and goddesses. So that's, and and we use different um, plant allies for our practices as well, Mm -hmm. which are sometimes closed, but it's very nature-based. So I never Mm -hmm. dismiss of sharing information about my culture because it is, I think, a birthright to all of us to work with and be in in community and connected to the earth and the nature spirits. So witchcraft means something very different to a lot of people. 
And for me, witchcraft is a practice, a spiritual practice that really helps me connect with the spiritual realms. It helps me connect with the weaving of manifestation, of healing, of connection to the earth and the sky and the universe and divinity. So for me, that's what witchcraft is, being an embodiment of my truth, being being in presence of all that is. I love that. And is this something that you practice every single day? Like you have your own rituals? So that's very interesting you ask that because that's like one of the biggest questions. So no, I Mm. literally have a ritualistic lifestyle. And what that means, it's not as hard as it it sounds. I've, I've turned my life and it doesn't matter what it is, any responsibility that I have, I'm a mother of two. I have to actually, you know, I have to take care of myself, like washing my hair, brushing my teeth, paying my bills, taking out the garbage, all of that stuff. I tell people, you don't necessarily have to add anything special into your life. You can look at your life the way it is right now, from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed. And all you have to do is list them and look at those individual things and give them a purpose, give them an intention. People today, they live a life of just going, going, going routine and just doing it because they were told just because an influencer told them, oh, this face mask is great, do it. But they don't know that they have, in order for that face mask to actually work or to be helpful for you, you mentally have to connect to that face mask. I know it sounds weird, (laughs) but tell yourself, why is this face mask so sacred? What, What are the benefits? Why are those benefits important to me and to my skin? And see into those things that you do throughout your day, even the mundane, even brushing your teeth and tell yourself, why do I do it? For who? Why is it important? And set an intention. And what you're doing is you set those mundane routines into little mini rituals throughout your day. And that's how I live my spiritual life. Oh my God. I love that so much. It's, I I heard something similar from another guest that came on the podcast where she was like, when I wash my face, I'm intentional. Like, oh, I am cleansing all the worries away or, you know, like it's, it's adding and infusing some purpose. And I I think that's, it it is really powerful to just add intention to everything. Yes. Yes. And mindfulness and presence. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I get a lot of people, I do, I have altars and I do do my candles and my rituals and my Mm -hmm. ceremonies, but they're not every day. I would go crazy. There's no way. (laughs) I (laughs) see. Wow. I'm exhausted most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So for instance, one of my most powerful rituals of the day is taking a shower. So Mm -hmm. water is spirit. And especially in my culture, water is our mother and it's, she's so powerful and she's so healing and she's accessible. I even say, even in the toilet, there's water that is still sacred water, even if it's in the toilet and we are water. So imagine we are spirit and we are sacred. So before going to the shower, I advise do a little prayer, thank the spirit for being there because not everyone has access to water or clean water and when you take the shower go in with prayer go in with intention and allow the waters to do what it is that you need so if you're stressed ask the water spirit to let go and release of all the stress if you need healing i usually get um migraines here and there maybe every three months and i kid you not my best remedy is my shower and the water. Mm. I go in there and I stay in there for at least 10, 15 minutes. And I focus my energy and intention on cleansing and clearing and identifying what's causing the problem. And I almost usually always hear or have a nudge as to what's causing my migraine. And it's usually stress. (laughs) Yeah. It's just an example of it's allowing you to know that you need to slow down, be more present mm-hmm. and be more mindful. Yeah. I love this so much. And the fact that you're pointing out water, like most of us, I would assume listening to this, have access to water. It's something so simple. And so it, it flows back to what you were saying earlier. Like you don't need a lot of money to, to have spiritual practices in your life. You don't need to buy yourself this spa package or that you have all the tools here. Everything can be used with intention and as part of your ritual. I think that's so inspiring. I don't know if you know, but I was homeless for almost three years and I bring up the story a lot because it proves point. I didn't have anything. 
I was living in the streets. I was, you know, tr- maybe in my friend's cars, I was hopping back and forth. And the only thing I did have was a dollar cactus that I bought in a dollar store. Mm. <laughs> it was like a little tiny one. Um, and stones that I would pick up from the river, branches, pine cones, because growing up, my mom always had me foraging because we didn't have a lot of money. We also use natural, um, tools and allies from the earth to practice our spirituality, to do our rituals and ceremonies. So I was already used to going out to nature and talking to the daisies and asking them permission Mm -hmm. if I could take her out. Daisy, for instance, she's, when I was homeless, she was easy accessible, right? She grows pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, chamomile also, and Mm -hmm. she helped me with keeping faith and keeping belief. Mm -hmm. So anytime I was down, I would literally eat the daisy. (laughs) It sounds aggressive, but it's not. She allowed me to set those intentions and I would pick the petal and I would place it in my mouth and I would just meditate with her. Um, and I would get Mm. this overwhelming feeling, this embrace from the earth and from the wind and from the spirit that everything was going to be okay just to keep going. Um, and I truly believe that that's really something that's accessible to everyone. You don't need anything but yourself. That is so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. That's it's so it, it's very moving to hear that. And and I'm also very inspired because and this leads to your next book, Plant Witchery, which I actually have here. Oh, <laughs> I can't I wait to dig in. I, I do. There's so much info in here. Um, yeah, I, I love this concept. I don't think many people appreciate this concept that all plants have a different spirit. And yes. And, and we're so, like, even I, I'm so clueless about it. All of us are so clueless about it. So tell us about that and then tell us where do we start if we want to learn to appreciate nature? Oh my gosh. So <laughs> again, growing up, I grew up in project housing and we were surrounded by cemeteries, like literally mountains of cemeteries. But in those cemeteries, there were flowers and trees, like abundance of nature. So I would spend my time there and not with the human kids. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I, I love live. it. Yeah, and yeah. while there, I felt when my home was very chaotic and my place of where I lived outside, there was a lot of, you know, violence and there was a lot of, you know, things happening that no child should be part of. But when I would go to the cemeteries and I would sit by a tree and play with the flowers, I felt this grounding and I felt this embrace. And I felt whispers and I could remember hearing these little whispers and I'm like, what the heck are these little whispers? Who's talking to me? And when I would lay in the grass, and and this is really something that pops out to me, dandelion, I would lay in the grass and I remember listening to dandelion and dandelion wanted to talk to me. She literally said, I want to talk to you. And then as a kid, you go back and you tell your friends or your parents and they're like, oh, it's just your imagination. And in school, it's just your imagination until my mom finally said, "Okay, this is serious. She's actually, you know, coming back with these stories um, and these messages that should not be coming from a child. And that allowed me to start believing in the power of actually communicating with the plants. And the only thing that was different about me and connecting with the plants is that I was always in a quiet space in a quiet state when I was out there, was calm and in tune with them and Mm -hmm. allowing them to, to enter me and their spirits to embrace me. So with the plant, with plant witchery, because a lot of people already had known my story and I was always sharing my plants, they wanted to know how I channeled or how I spoke to them. And it's not hard. It's not as hard as you may think. Remember you are nature. You literally are nature. There is no separation from you or spirit and and nature and your ancestors. You are all of it within yourselves. So there's no way that you cannot hear or feel nature. You will. When you give that intention of wanting to, it will start to happen. So I suggest, um, for instance, if you have your beautiful fiddle in back of you, you can sit with your your plant and meditate with your plants. And before the before you sit and meditate with your plant, ask the plant that if there's any messages, if there's anything that the plant wants to tell you or to just please join you in meditation, the more that you do it, the more that you're going to feel comfortable opening up and surrendering to the possibility and the magic of the messages. I remember when Mm -hmm. I first started doing meditation with plants, it started as like tingles. And then after the tingles, it started feeling like vibrations around my body. I could feel it coming from the plant. 
And then after that, I started to realize that through meditation, anyone can access their wisdom and their healing properties and their messages, which is really important in anybody's practice. I love that. Can you give some examples of what you've, like what plants have communicated with you? I'm just curious. Willow, are they per- very personal to your life or are they just general like nature statements? No, very personal to me is a willow. Mm-hmm. I just bought this home last year and we're looking to plant a willow tree on the land. Willow was also in the cemetery and I went through a lot of trauma and I would lay underneath the willow and you know, the willow comes down and cascades. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's like my safe place. I kid you mm-hmm. not, every time I walk through those beautiful um, branches and leaves and I would go under, I felt like I went into another realm. Willow is very mothering. And Willow, I believe, was my parent, my grandmother. Oh. Oh. Not uh, my literal grandmother, but grandmother of the earth, an elder. Right. And yeah. while I was under there, there was this sense of safety, this sense of peace. And I will never forget it because it's something that I carry within myself. I even named my first cat Willow. <laughs> yeah. So Willow for me, and it's she's very healing. So even if you just go to a Willow tree and you sit next to it or under it, the healing that happens with Willow, she loves to strip you from your pain. She loves to strip you from anything that's bothering you because again, she is like a grandmother, like a mother. <laughs> um, wow. Willow, the sunflower. Mm-hmm. The sunflower is another one. When I was homeless, I remember I used, there was this parking lot that I would sit next to the garbage bins, like the, the side of the garbage bins. And the reason why I was doing that is because I didn't want anyone to see me. It was, it was a form of protection and the nighttime. There was sunflowers growing from the cracks of the cement. And it was so inspiring. A lot of people ask me, do I have people who inspire me? I think that plants inspire me more. Mm. Watching how resilient that sunflower was, watching how that sunflower did not have a care in the world for the chaos that was happening around it because it was garbage around it, you know, people throwing stuff on it. Um, its focus was on the sun. Yeah. I'm directing itself to find nourishment wherever it could. And that really inspired me throughout my life, even during that time, to get out of the situation I was in and focus on what was going to nourish me and focus myself on the light, on the sun, and keep going and knowing that everything was going to be okay. So beautiful. I've actually had a similar experience. Like in my backyard, there's like these little cracks in the, the you know, in the ground and then little weeds growing. I'm, I always see them. I'm like, you are so resilient. Like, how did you, like nobody planted you. You just like showed up and through the crack, you just decided to grow so strong. And yes. yeah, I have been inspired in the same way. That's so cute. Yeah, I'm like, oh, little rock star. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a really beautiful and powerful message, right? You know, we all, they originate in the dark in the dirt, Mm -hmm. on the ground. And no one tells the plant how to grow. No one tells the plant what to do, what it needs. It just knows because it's present Mm -hmm. with itself. And in the darkness, like the plant, I found the light. I found how to direct myself in a way that everything that surrounds me, everything that comes within me is nourishment so that I can Mm -hmm. rise, so that I can bloom, and so that I can come out of the darkness being able to see from a different perspective. So there's so much wisdom when we pay attention to nature in that way. I love that. Um, So you have a ton, I think over 200 plants in this book. I'm just curious, like, how did the research process happen? Like, what did that look like? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, this this was insane. So I have to tell you, I channel. So I channeled every single one of them. I have over 450 plants in my home. And even with the move, now I have land. So now we we just started spring. So now I will have, we're going to start our gardens and I'm going to record that and share it on social media. But all of the plants that are in here and the trees and the herbs, I've connected to them personally and channeled with them personally. So what this book does that no other book does is that not only does it give you the real origins of the plants, it also gives you, um, their wisdom and their dream interpretation. Some That's not something that you see in books with plants. So wisdom is so important because this is something that a lot of indigenous people, 
this is how they connect to the world of the earth, of the nature spirits. A lot of Native Americans, a lot of people who love to be out with nature and commune and weave magic with nature. So I was like, it would be really powerful if I created a book where these messages for each of these plants that people could easily access, whether it's at a park, and, and they could pick it up at the store, at a plant store, or they can grow it themselves. For them to know that they have these beautiful allies, these beautiful spirits that actually want to work with them. And these spirits that actually will impact your spiritual growth and your healing and even help you in creativity. I These babies back here, like yeah. the, this is the Monstera. She's a cheese Monstera. Yeah. This Monstera here, she, I feel every time I have an idea and I go for it, I feel she gets happier. She produces a lot of creativity and focus. I'm a Pisces sun and a Cancer moon. So my focus is like in the dream world. (laughs) I'm always Uh daydreaming. So I put plants around me that help me focus, especially around my work table and in my work area. Um, So there's so many different things that you can access through plants. I love that. Wow. So I'll, everyone, I'll definitely share that link in the show notes to get that book. Cause I'm sure there, there's a plant for every need, (laughs) whatever you're looking for. You know how they say there's an app for that. There's a plant for that. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Can you, maybe you you can share your top three favorite plants and and their purposes then. Yes. So I, maybe I'll share ones too that are easy to care for. You want me to do that too? Ones that are easy, that are pretty common that you can find in any, any plant store. So pathos, ivy, cactus, snake plant, and zizi plant. Zizi plant is this one. So I'm yeah, I think I have plant. one too. Yeah. You see zizi plant? So just by looking at my zizi plant, do you see how there's growth on one side and there's not a lot of growth here? She also has a little bit of a darker green here and a lighter green here. So when I feel her energy, oh, you have a zizi plant? I do. Okay, it's I actually my mom's, it. but it's downstairs. Yeah. I can, I, I can feel the ZZ plant. So <laughs> the ZZ plant, this plant, it's funny that you mentioned your mom. This is really good for reparenting yourself. It's really oh. good for giving yourself love that you probably lacked in your life. And oh, when wow. I see an imbalance in my plant like this, that it's not growing fully, she's letting me know that there's work to be done. And I know that work that needs to be done because Although we think that we are healed or that we might have forgiven or that we might have gotten over certain situations that we've had in connections to our parents or our guardians, um, there's still things that we had really well within ourselves because it brought us too much pain. It brought us too much confusion or we just didn't know how to handle those emotions. And when she grows this way, what she's letting me know is, girl, you have some inner child work to still do, and that's okay, right? She's showing me that there's growth, there's a possibility of growth, but I still need to do that work to reach this part here. I'm really Mm -hmm. crazy with my plants. I'm like, there is- No, I love that. It's so fascinating to me. It, 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 you know what? It really, truly is. I wish that I could like have a show where I can just bring people on and we talk about plants all day long. Oh my! You, I think you should do it. I would watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. I'm gonna try. I, I okay. just started. A, I just started a publishing company, so I'm like baby steps, <gasps> nice. so I don't overwhelm yeah, myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one thing at a time. Uh, another question is like, so you say that plant reflects your journey, but like, is the plant? Does it matter who's the owner of the plant, or does it just feel of the energy of who spends the most time next year? Yes, it's definitely energy connection. Okay. So I have plants, for instance, this snake plant here that my mom gave me the baby of. She actually, it grew from like one seedling and she's super abundant. When she was with my mom, she wasn't really growing well. And oh, yeah. I would tell my mom, mommy, you know, you have, she's like, yes, I know I have work to do. <laughs> like, I don't want to hear it. I don't that's really funny. It. Oh, that's funny. So with the, with a snake plant, for instance, The snake plant is very protective. Mm -hmm. So when I see my snake plant not doing so well and she doesn't look so vibrant, I know that I have to do an energetic cleansing. It takes on a lot of the energy and the stagnant energy that you carry, especially like problems or issues or heaviness from other people. And you're on social media a lot. So Mm -hmm. you you do 
kind of grab onto a lot of those energies. They just get stuck on your aura, on your energetic field. Mm. This right here, you should have all over your house. Snake plant. We do have a big one downstairs too. Uh, I need to, I need to put more plants up here though, in my workspace. I only have my fiddle. I have a big monstera in the living room, but yeah. Yeah. Bring them all in. Also fiddle loves um, companions. They talk a lot. Okay. They're very so you mean a, pl- a plant companion or, or should I just companion. talk to it more? Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you bring a cactus into the space, yeah. um, she'll have a, a, a perfect companion because cactus are chatty as well. But what happens is with the fiddle, if you just have the fiddle alone in the room with you, you're going to have destruction from focus. So imagine oh, really? if you had... Yeah, so the focusing oh would become God. a little bit of a difficulty. So imagine if you would place another plant in there, kind of test it out and see, hmm, is my focus better? Is my um, willingness to do more work better? Or my willingness to pay attention to my self-care better? Because a lot of times they talk and you can't really, if you don't hear it energetically, it's interfering with your energy and interfering with your create creative source. Thanks for sharing all of that. I love all of this info because I, I do talk to my plants, but I haven't really meditated and really sat with them to listen. But I love this, this building this relationship with nature and, and you are nature. I, yes, yeah. you are. And we mm-hmm. forget. We totally yes. forget. And, yes. and a lot of when people are like, oh, you know, the world is in chaos. The earth is dying. What do you suppose is happening to you? Why do you think everything is so chaotic when humankind is not well? And, you know, we're not well, especially since 2020, everything's been elevated into a space of, you know, everyone's just disconnecting, separating, spiritually bypassing, doing everything they can to like disconnect from the real world. And what that's doing is disconnecting you from yourself. And when you disconnect from yourself, you disconnect from your your ancestors, your nature self, the earth self, right? The nurture spirits and divinity. And when you do that, it causes chaos in the world. It just shows up in different ways. So I really do believe that the solve to a lot of the things that are happening is that if we can for a moment, just think about how sacred we truly are and how beautiful we really are and how whole we are and how connected we are to the earth and everything around us, because that's who we are. When we pass, where do we go? Into the earth. Where does the spirit go? Into divinity. And who do you think is out there spewing and telling us these beautiful whispers and these beautiful wisdom? Those are all the ancestors of the land, whether they're yours or not, right? And that's another important key too. Find out what land you're on. Find out mm-hmm. who used to live there, what what indigenous people live there. Also, and find out what plants are the, native to the, the land that you're on. It's really important because those plants are the most powerful in your mm-hmm. healing and spiritual growth because they are from the land. Where mm-hmm. I landed, I'm... I was just going to talk to you about gardening zones. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in zone six. <laughs> what does that mean? What it, zone six, what the zones do is that they let you know what kind of plants you can grow and what will survive on the land that you're on. Okay. And like I told you, I just came to this home last summer. We just purchased it. This is my first spring. So I am super speaking out about all the flowers. There's daffodils growing on my land. I'm like, I didn't see you in the summer. Where did you come yeah. from? So I heard and I found out that daffodils have been here for over a hundred years. And I'm like, that's interesting because in this zone, usually it's not something um, that you would see and that would survive a, such a brutal cold, but they're sprouting mm-hmm. everywhere and they're super healthy. So for me, I'm excited to work with their energy and, and have them be allies in my craft. I love that. So, so whatever plants naturally gl- grow in your land is the most powerful, you said? The most powerful for that land and for that spirit energy of where you mm, are. They're really, okay. really important. Also, if there's okay. a certain plant that calls to you that you say you go to a plant shop and you're like, wow, this is really beautiful. I don't know what the heck it is, but mm. I really love this plant. It's calling me. It's nudging me. There's a reason for that. It's just like crystals almost. You know how people say... Con- by the crystals you connect to the same thing with the plants the plant has something to tell you it wants to work with you for a reason there's something that the plant identified within you that you need help with or support with wow i love that thank you um let's move on and talk about your recent book now the altar within so so why are you excited about this one 
um, because this book is so raw. It's when I was with Bit Publishing, my voice was very diluted. I, I also say, you know, they, they didn't want to share my full story because, yes, some of us do come from a background that's not so nice and sweet to hear. But I can't not speak my truth and not tell my story because it's a part of who I am. And it's part of where what got me to where I am now. So in this book, I talk about it starts with um, December 2020. I passed away. I had a heart attack. <sighs> Oh my gosh. And because of COVID, um, the ambulance, I lived in Jersey City. So over there, there was a lot of COVID cases. All the hospitals were full. Um, they literally told my husband, you have to wait for the ambulance to get there. There's no one available right now. And they were helping him with like trying to identify if I was alive or not. So that's how oh he God. ended up knowing that I wasn't. Um, oh my God. I came back from that experience and I took off social media for eight months. And that's when I wrote the book, this book, The Altar Within. Mm-hmm. And while I was there, I don't know if it's because I'm a seer and, I'm, and I've gone into visions many times throughout my life. But while I was there, it seemed like an eternity. I'm telling you, I came back and I could not believe that this was real life. I was very disconnected. How from long the do world. you were out for? Not, no more than three minutes, he says. Oh, my God. It was like, it was like three minutes, but it seemed like a lifetime. But for me, I was out yeah. for years. Like, I <gasps> Tell was us your experience. Like, what did you feel? What did you see? So I start off the book by explaining that I ended up landing like in this really dark space. And it's interesting because a lot of the visions or nightmares that I would have growing up, it was always black, always dark. Mm-hmm. And I would feel like something was coming at me. Like it just wa- was running, 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 trying to get me. And that's what I thought all my life growing up. It was something trying to get me, something trying to get me. The same thing happened when I went in death. I was in the darkness and I felt something running, running, running. And and, and I would always wake up right in my dreams. This time I had no choice. I, I, I had to be there. These big, big eyes opened. They were very amber. And then I felt this calmness from those eyes and then everything illuminated. And it was this really big wolf. And this wolf has been trying to contact me my entire freaking life. Wow. And I was so scared of what was hidden in the darkness. Mm-hmm. And the wolf spoke to me and told me that I wasn't really being myself. I wasn't really living an authentic life. It was telling me that I was suffocating myself. It was telling me that I, was, I would not have a second, cho- a second chance to be who I am if I continue to live this way. Through the wolf, then I was like plunged into auto underwater. It was really dark, but I can tell it was underwater. And I was just slowly, slowly floating down. I was out of body, but I was also in body. It was like I was experiencing everything at the same time. And as I was going into the waters, that's when I heard this voice that told me to breathe. Can you imagine being underwater and being told to breathe, take a breath? (laughs) So... The surrender that has to happen when you're underwater and they're telling you to take a breath for you to trust is insanely difficult. I remember struggling and I think I spent a lot of time there. Like, no, I'm not opening my mouth. (laughs) I'm like, there's no way. And then I was just like, I can't stay here. I have to trust. There was always this, this embracing voice that kept telling me, trust, believe, it's okay, you're okay. And I finally opened my mouth and I took a breath and it's like the whole ocean went inside of me. And that's when the journey started for me in death, where I started speaking to my ancestors. When I started speaking to people, I had no idea. There were like star beings there. There were animals. (laughs) I love this. Oh my gosh. It's kind of like, you know, when you dream Mm -hmm. and you go from one dream to the other. Yeah. Yeah. It's like different worlds. Yeah. yeah. I'm getting goosebumps. Sorry. Cause it, you know, Still That's what they say is like another dimension, right? Because you, you're you're not in one location. It's, you're yeah. not in one location. It's just mm-hmm. ridiculous. There's no way that your brain can comprehend it. So the surrender that has to happen is the human surrender. Is the surrender of everything you've been taught of the limit that you've been t- teaching yourself that you you have you know limits and you are unlimited you can you have unlimited potential you are so powerful and you're capable of so many things but because we're raised in a certain way you know we're we're raised in a certain way where we don't 
access that power, when we don't access that faith, that surrender, um, we go through life um, really half-assing everything and, and our potential and, our, and a divine purpose. So under there, when I finally surrendered, I've never gone back before that. I've been surrendered since. And I wow. really feel that that surrender is what helped me write this book. That surrender is what helped me manifest everything. I've manifested incredible things since I've come back. And I've always been a really good manifester, but this is insanely yeah. different from buying my first home. I'm 41 years old and this happens mm-hmm. Now, um, wow. I have a publishing company, I'm a multiple bestseller. Like there's so many beautiful, oh, I got engaged after a freaking 12 years of waiting. <laughs> Congrats. You know, wow. That's amazing. Like life just changed for you. Everything right, changed right after. and I yeah. totally changed. I used to be someone that plans and plans and plans. I have, I still have some of it. I have vision boards on top of vision boards. I have boxes with dreams and and bucket lists. I have all of these things. And what that surrender helped me identify when I came back is who the hell am I doing this for? Who am I doing all these things for? Why am I planning all this? Where is the root of my actions? Where is the root of what I do on a daily basis of how I think, of how I create? So I dissected myself. I went into a lot of introspection. Um, I, and I investigated, I interrogated every single part of my life from what I wore to what I ate to how I self-harmed. You know, we talk about self-harm and mm. it's something that a lot of... What, people don't want to talk about, but things like doing things that do not support you is self-harm. Things like not paying attention to your body, your mental state and your self-care is self-harm. I know it's a strong word, but there is an essence of it. So for me, I was able to look back and tell myself, girl, you are hurting yourself. Mm. And you know what? It's okay to now be aware of it. So what are we going to do to move forward? Whereas before I was such a great planner, but I wasn't really consistent and I couldn't finish everything. Now, anything that I plan comes from the heart, comes from my truth. And I've Mm. been able to be consistent. I've been able to find rest and while I'm doing all the things that I love. And I've also been able to manifest things that are supportive of my dreams and the things that I want to accomplish in life. That is so inspiring. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so I know that's a crazy journey. Ah. It is. And, and and in terms of like the actionable parts, you said you interrogated all the parts of yourself. Like, who am I doing this for? I think that's a really good exercise. And I think I, I'm going to try to do more of that because you, you're doing all these things. You have all these goals and plans, but like, who really is it for? And Who is yeah. it for? Those eight months... First, the first couple of months was really hard because I had to come back to earth, like literally ground, come back to my body. I actually believed that I was still dead. I was like, this is <laughs> probably heaven for me because I'm with wow. my husband. I have a house and I have my, I, yeah. it was like, I, I lost, I lost my mind. I lost my shit. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> <Sorry>. okay. I <laughs> get it. And you're already, like you said, Pisces or cancer. You have all that dreaminess in you already. Yes. So coming back, I was like, you can, my, the only people who had access to me was my immediate family my elders from my tribe, the the shamans and healers, they would come and see me and, you know, talk to me and, and, and let me know it's okay. You're fine. You're here. And I couldn't comprehend it. I was just like, Mm -hmm. no, leave me alone. Like, it's okay. And, and, And they were like, it's you. It's just a different you. And I'm like, no, it's mm. not me. Uh, it was just, I couldn't explain to them everything that I had gone through and everything that I just understood. Um, and I had this fear within me. I was like, I'm going to forget everything that I just learned in death because I'm going to ground and come back to my body. I had this understanding that the expansive universe cannot fit in this brain, in this human (laughs) brain of yours. Imagine if you at all times understood and were connected to the expansive universe. There's, it's insanity. Yeah, it's hard. You're not built that way to be experiencing that here on earth, but you are part of all of it. So I was really coming to a place of calm and peace where I understood that I would never lose that connection. And it was okay for me to start forgetting a little bit because it was good for the health of my humanness. So 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I totally spaced. I'm like thinking about everything it's that okay. was happening. <laughs> no, I love hearing about it. It's so fascinating because I everybody has questions about this. A lot of people, they would love, no, I don't know if they would love, but they're so curious about experiences like this where you truly feel like you're connected to everything and, and understand everything. And like you said, like maybe our human brain isn't just, we're just not meant to understand it, but we're, we're just meant to feel it, right? There is no understanding. That's what we have to understand. There is no questions because there are no answers. I mm. hope I, I hope that makes sense in a way. There is no questions. There it just is. And then you're just part of it. And you're just mm-hmm. this moving, beautiful energy that's flowing and weaving and creating life, dying and rebirth. Every season that happens through the earth, we as humans, we go through our own seasons as well. You're not going to be the same person you are now 10 years from now. It's a different season of your life. The same thing with purpose. Everyone, when I came back to like, so, so did you figure it out? What's our purpose? How do we figure it out? I'm like, you know what? You're going to hate the answer. You don't have one purpose. Every season of your life, there's a different purpose. And that purpose Mm -hmm. is there to support you. And I know that we're beings like you, for instance, that you love to help your community. You like to share, you like to guide them just like I do, but that is not your purpose. That is something that brings you joy. And when joy gets sucked out of that, it becomes work. So we have to to identifying when did the joy get sucked out of a passion of mine of being there to guide and help others? Where did mm-hmm. that happen? And address that so that you can bring joy back into the work that you do. So you don't necessarily have to adjust your whole career or life. You just have to go back and find the joy in it. And finding an introspection and interrogating yourself. Um Again, it, I wrote a whole, the whole book, it, it's about interrogating the self and looking into the self and all of that. But the best part of it is the prompts where you really ask yourself these really personal and hard questions. Like for instance, I used to do a lot of dieting and I didn't know who I was doing it for. I just knew I had to do it. I was like, I have to diet. I have to lose weight. I have to fit into a closet full of clothes that are like four sizes smaller than I am right now. So one of the interrogations, one of the things I looked at, for instance, I'm bringing out my closet because to me, that was a really powerful step in shifting my life moving forward. I took out all those clothes and I'm like, these clothes for a size smaller than myself, it's not me. This is someone else Mm. who I'm trying to create. Therefore, I am harming myself and not loving myself because I'm telling myself that I'm not good enough to wear beautiful clothing unless I'm four size smaller. So you start going into this journey and it keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper until you find the root cause of everything. And then I'm like, why do I think that because I'm heavier, I'm not good enough to wear these beautiful, sexy clothes or clothes that make me feel powerful. I don't feel like um, people are going to like me or love me. Um, like they would if I was smaller. And then I root cause goes all the way back. I'm, t- I'm not kidding you not. This goes back until I was seven years old. I remember my mom told me, you're our neighbor. She was very religious. And she's like, our neighbor says that you have to do your confirmation. You have to do your communion. And we weren't religious. But my mom was like, everybody else is doing it. And everyone keeps asking me if she, she felt guilt because her children haven't done it. So they put me in this very pink dress, very fluffy, and these pink stockings and these pink shoes. And I remember the lady saying, wow, you look like Miss Piggy. And he's like, maybe if we put your hair up, you'll look thinner. And that also was something I did in my life, was put my hair up. I rarely let my hair down because according to her, it made my face look bigger. And according to her, I looked like Miss Piggy when I wore a dress. And it was just like, it was rooted into that. And I found that and I healed that. And immediately Mm -hmm. my closet transformed. Now I buy clothes that fit me, clothes that make me feel confident and I feel special and I feel sexy. And that's what happens when you start interrogating and you start asking yourself, why are you doing this? Why are you not doing this? Where is it rooted from? It's really powerful. Thanks for sharing that. This is something that's relatable to all women, I believe. We all have like a story that we can go back to. I I feel like I have a handful too. And it's, yeah, where are these beliefs really coming from? And then how can we truly heal from them and let them go? And, And I love the idea of like, 
Like if your closet is like, like these clothes are not, it's not who you are right now. So instead of trying to change yourself to fit that, like you can just get rid of them, get, get new clothes that make you feel beautiful. Like there's no trying to change, like there's no forcing yourself. Like you can change th- the things around you to, to support you. Wow. So in plant right? witchery, my favorite <laughs> quote from there is uh-huh. literally this, the plant, there is nothing wrong with the plant. If the plant is not doing well and it's not surviving, it's because of its environment. When you change the environment around the plant, the plant thrives. There was never something wrong with the plant. It was the lack of nourishment, the lack of light, maybe, the adjustment of the the soil that needed to happen. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with us. There is nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with you. What needs to change is your environment, the people you hang out with, what you digest, like TV, social media, everything around you should be nourishment to your soul and should be nourishment to your heart. Especially if you're someone like me, for instance, who does come from a a really big passive um, trauma for me, nourishment with people and what I watch and who I follow is really crucial in my journey for the rest of my life to keep joy present because it needs to support me and needs to help mm-hmm. me heal through my journey. So it's really beautiful that you brought that up because it, it's totally... Oh my gosh. <laughs> I've gotten chill so many times during this interview because it's so good what you said. I love that metaphor. There's nothing wrong with the plant. It's about It's the environment. And the same thing with us. It's nothing wrong with us. It's just your environment. So start to be aware, okay, what's not nourishing you in your environment? I love yes. this. So good. And so a good. Of, a lot of the times it's, there's things, that, the book, The Ultra Within, the beauty about this book um, is that it does have you face yourself. Because a lot of the things that happen is you need to call yourself out on your own BS. You need to call yourself out on the things that you do to yourself that you don't even speak about with yourself. You have to communicate with yourself. You have to have conversations with yourself. You have to treat yourself like you're your own best friend and be like, bestie, you know that this has not been working for you. Why do you keep self-sabotaging in this way? Why do you continue to do this? Why are you hiding this? Why aren't you confident in this way like you should be? These conversations that you have with yourself are truly important because in reality, we are so used to trying to find permission and trying to find affirmation from outside of us from other people, from other sources, from other teachers and leaders. And when in fact, you just have to turn that inward and ask yourself permission and heal within yourself and have those conversations. Yes. Do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with our listeners, like a final message? Final message. Don't give up on yourself. I don't care how many times you've given up. I'm going to cry. I'm so sorry. (laughs) (laughs) No. I love everything about today. You are so powerful. Like you are a force. I just want you to know that. I I love you. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. I really do care so much because Mm -hmm. we give up so much. We're tired. Mm -hmm. We're overwhelmed. Yeah. And the world that we live in, it just, you know, it's like banging and banging and banging and banging on us. And there's this part of us, our spirit wants to be involved and make a difference. And our spirit wants to be there and show up, but we can't because we're so exhausted. We're so unhealed and, and, and there's no space for us to give more energy, right? There's so much that's been stripped away from us. And my ultimate message is don't give up on yourself. I don't care how many times you think you failed, keep trying because you're worthy of keeping that faith within yourself that you are going to reach the point where you're going to find liberation within yourself, where are you mm-hmm. going to find peace, where are you going to find joy? A lot of the times we just think that because we tried certain things and they didn't work out, that we're just not good at it or that it's not meant for us. And that's not the truth. It's just that those outside sources may not be what supports you. And you just have to keep trying and don't ever give up on trying on yourself. Don't give up on yourself. Thank you so much for sharing. And lastly, where can we find you online? Everywhere via I am Juliet Diaz. And beware, mm-hmm. because I know if you notice social media now, there's scammers impersonating accounts like crazy. So I do not do readings. I do not DM you and ask you for money. Okay. And oh, wow. There's no underscores, no double letters in my name. It's just simply I am Juliet Diaz. 
Okay. And everybody make sure you follow her, check out all of her books. I'll link everything in the show notes. Thank you so much, Julia, for an amazing interview. So many inspirational points throughout our conversation. I really enjoyed it. I am so honored and grateful, especially I'm like fangirling inside of myself. (laughs) I am so grateful for this. (laughs) So am I. Thank you. I appreciate you so much.